welcome. I'm very happy today to welcome my longtime friend and still teacher, Ken Fields. Uh, Ken's uh, not only my teacher, uh, he's got a number of his students in the faculty in the English department uh, here. Um, Ken is the, uh, teaches at Stanford, has for many years. Uh, he's the author of a number of, of, of books, some of, some of which I can show you. Uh, the Other Walker, Sunbelly, The Odysseus Manuscripts, and then two recent books that are on the table out there. I don't know if they're for sale because I've been told that, uh, that the co-op sold out of, uh, of its stock. Uh, but August Delights and uh, his first book from the University of Chicago Press, and I hope it's the uh, first of, of a series, Classic Rough News uh, this year, uh, which I rec recommend highly. One wants to be able to uh, say something very telling and acute about the uh, quality or of, the, uh, of the, the, the poems that we're about to hear when one's doing what I'm doing, introducing someone. Um, I've not seen Ken's newest work, so I don't actually know exactly what we're going to hear. Uh, but I have no, no trouble identifying the quality uh, of, um, of the writing that I, uh, that I know of as, as Ken's. And the, the word that I use is generosity. And this is, uh, this is a term that I think applies to his writing and very much to his teaching, too, as his students uh, can attest. This is a term that actually comes uh, from uh, uh, meaning noble birth. And that's not very helpful. Um, because uh, his work is uh, quite strenuously uh, and joyfully vernacular. I think that maybe the right term for what I'm talking about is magnanimous, uh, signifying largeness of spirit. Uh, excuse me. <laughs> uh, and, uh, and, and poetically, openness uh, to di diverse experiences, to diverse subjects, and to diverse forms. The term openness uh, in poetics, though, is usually set against the term formality. And Ken is very much a maker of recognizable forms. Now, what, what, what I'm identifying as generosity is a kind of strength of spirit. That's a sense of the term, too. Uh, and, uh, and it's a very appropriate, appropriate one. Ken is also a one-time football player. The poems I've, uh, I've heard from him in the recent past have been founded on pleasures taken greedily from experiences of all kinds, uh, painful ones and not so painful ones, lots of poems on tough experiences. Pleasures taken from reading, pleasures taken from drinking and from not drinking, pleasures taken from remembering, from loving and from listening. The formality of his poems is always a pleasure realized, not a manner of resistance or of control or a stay against confusion in my, in, in my sense of things, uh, despite the fact that, as I say, the poems come from very tough experiences. When a poem can be had in shapely syntax or in 14 lines, that's a genial pleasure in itself. And it's at the heart of the poems of his that I most treasure. Please join me in welcoming Ken Fields. Uh, most of the poems I'm going to read today are from the University of Chicago book. So uh, I just want to express my gratitude to the University of Chicago, to Randy Patillos, Stephanie Wylak, Parker Smathers, and all of the other people who put up with my delays and refusals to answer letters and things like that. It's good to see old friends here. Bob, Braden, Carl, a uh, couple of, uh, of uh, distinguished poets, Jim Powell and um, Elaine Rawlings in the back. Uh, so I'm, I'm uh, a little awed to be here, though it feels comfortable because Chicago has been good to me. Um, the Odysseus Manuscripts was published in Chicago, and uh, the Chicago Review published uh, Lots of the poems that, uh, that I'm going to be reading today. 
I just came from a wonderful talk about Ceylon and about the figure of Meridian, the point of noon, and uh, it struck me that uh, I should say a little something about a poem that came to me then. I don't know. Um, not, it didn't come to me, it wasn't my poem. Uh, the point of noon was used a lot in the 19th century, the figure of noon. And uh, one of the ways it was used was a kind of, as a kind of absolute moment. It was sometimes a dangerous moment because your shadow went inside your body. You have a shadow. But uh, it was a, it, you might think of it as a theoretical moment as well. And it's almost noon. It's almost noon. It's almost noon. It's noon. It's not noon anymore. It's like the Augustinian present without uh, anticipation or memory. And Ivor Winters, when my old teacher, who was a Chicago uh, man and probably published this poem in Chicago uh, in a Poetry Magazine of Verse with many others, uh, wrote, us, uh, wrote a little book of uh, one-line poems, uh, The Magpie's Shadow. I'm sure it's in your special collections here. Six-syllable poems with the title. And this one was called The God of Roads. I, Peregrine of Noon. What the hell is that? Uh, the god of Rhodes is Hermes, uh, who was noted for speed, among other things, lying and other things like that. And uh, it really celebrates that moment of noon as it runs down a road. So it's like presentness and speed. I'm in the moment of noon now, 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 with the speed of light. Peregrine, of course, is the bird noted for its speed. It also means wanderer across our borders. And so one way of thinking about that poem uh, I'm going to talk about innuendo tomorrow, but I'm just kind of warming up, right? Uh, would be, I who wander around in the moment of noon. That's a poem of some, what, significance and power. I'm going to start with a, a somewhat longer poem, uh, not from the book. Uh, <clears throat> Diana Young and I were talking about this story. I don't think she's seen the poem, but she knows the story. And since she has to leave early, uh, I thought I'd read it first. Um, my mother will be 91 tomorrow, <clears throat> so it seems appropriate to remember her today. Uh, she's losing almost all of her short-term memory, but she's uh, got everything from the past, and particularly all of the um, dreadful things my father did. Uh, so that's what uh, she talks about. And you'll see, she has a reason. So someone would know. When I was a fish, she nourished me. More than 60 years later, when I visit, drifting through the kitchen, she slowly fixes pot roast, greens, fresh bread. My father took us fishing in the Sierras, steep drops and cold, fast water, trout drying in the creel on ferns, speckled, like the brown patches now on my shins. She took us too, my brother and me, when he was away working. The little coastal streams near Arroyo Grande, small fish, but more than that, what I remember, the Japanese couple in the field above the creek, six years out of internment, and too poor for machinery or livestock, taking turns hitched to the plow, pulling the blade while the other guided it into furrows taking turns. That was the astonishing thing. My father's dead nine months now. My mother wakes certain he's in the room and turns to greet that absence. Some souvenirs, brass knuckles, my brother's got them, a railroad watch, a lantern, a marble, an aggie that was never broken, another split in two, white thread meandering through it, and my mother's memorials. She always begins by reminding herself it wasn't all bad. And then her stories. I've heard most of them for the last 30 years and never tire of their focus like a stream of water or steam escaping from a pressure cooker. My daddy and brothers would never do that, she says. I never thought a man could hit a woman. It shamed me so soon after we were married a time or two, I'd gone back to my folks just a mile away. We were all farmers working the same hard land, and times were different in Texas anyway. I guess they're different now. I never told them why I came back home. 
I guess Mama knew. With a little money a dead uncle left her, not much. She bought pretty red linen and made me a new outfit. Hard, pretty work like she always did. Bound buttonholes, no telling how much time it took, and round pearl buttons, a skirt, a three-quarter tunic flared at the bottom. I was proud of it, intended to wear it for the first time to church. In those days, folks drove for miles to the tent meetings. He never went, and I never thought he'd mind if I did. He came home tired. I had dinner ready and was ironing the jacket, wearing only the skirt. I was stubborn then, which is how I married him when people warned against it. I didn't know anything. I said I'd go without him, and he threw a fit. He threw 40 fits was how he praised someone. And before I knew it, he'd slapped me hard and ripped my skirt off, tore it again and again. I cried like a baby, gathered up my things, and went to Mom and Daddy's. I stayed two weeks. My brothers would have killed him if they'd known for sure. They'd have had to kill him. He couldn't stand being whipped. He was a shit, I tell her, squirming on the hook. You know he loved you, she corrects. When I came back, he told me how he'd driven his car back and forth in front of Daddy's house, thought about wrecking it, running it into a tree. I'd see him, and we'd be together again. It was always about him. His mother said he could say and do the worst things and be the sorriest afterward. When we moved out of that old house, I left the torn dress in a cardboard box. I knew his folks would go through the house afterward. I left it there so they would find it, I told myself, so someone would know. Sixty-six years later, she's telling it, just so someone would know. His sister, talking about raising boys, said to my mother, I'd rather have them be mean than sissies. Just those were the choices. So, I picked the sissies. Voices of silence are the camaraderie of influence. This is one of the poems. These are improvised poems. They're poems I wrote sort of one by one at a fairly high rate. Lots of strange quotations in them. I, don't expect anybody to know them all or anybody to even know most of them. I tend to forget some of them. So, uh, But it, it, the, the, there are lots of characters that came in. I didn't realize there were going to be characters in the, in the poems. They just started occurring. And there's a one character that says, I, it's not always the same character. You might think it was me, and sometimes it is, but I won't tell which. My daughter's here. Maybe she knows. So, um, but it's somebody who feels is at, at home with uh, characters in books uh, as uh, with people. Um, this is sort of a poem in response to the so anxiety of influence we used to read about a long time ago. Voices of silence or the camaraderie of influence. Our ancestors? Well, family certainly. Then families of friends in books. Ford Maddox Ford, a stretcher of points saw fiction as a life, recalled with deep affection a gentleman he'd met at a garden party years before, counted him as a friend, only to find him tucked away in one of the minor tales of Henry James, a friend. This sort of thring, thing drives wild his scholars, among whom is a friend. We would do well to love our predecessors, not anxiously. Others were here before us offering their fellow feeling. Listen to one on his ancestors, Sir Thomas Brown. We mercifully preserve their bones and piss not upon their ashes. And there are plenty of people whose ashes we ought to piss on if they would just die, but that's another story. Separate camp is the way the book starts. Description of my side of the bed, which is only slightly better than it, than it uh, than it was then. These poems go back a ways. I started writing them when I got the, what was, the, I thought, terrible news that uh, I was an alcoholic. And then, then there was a terrible, even more terrible news that I couldn't drink. That was even the worst <laughs> part, right? But uh, this is called Separate Camp. 
The scattered books on my side of the bed, torn covers, broken backs, and the hacked limbs, a fortress in defeat or under siege, at best a losing battle. Will my life, clutters, dust rats, middens of papers gradually topple in visions that would kill a wino, dishearten the purest nun? Is this my France hyper-defended my old Maginot line? A cluttered, like a cloistered virtue squints, missing the closest foe. Castle and host, book and bookworm, clap and clap hound. I know myself what I fear the most. Priesthoods of self, cutting my nose or something worse to spite the unexorcised adversary of my life. Montaigne is in this book uh, as a kind of hero. Uh, he only comes in directly in a, in a couple of poems, but, but I, I think of him often. And he, he's here at the end of this poem where, he, uh, where he's warning against too much uh, intellectual subtlety in the wrong place. He said, these are, these are like men who are trying to square the circle while lying on their wives. You know, and that seems to me an kind of interesting thing. Along the watchtower, Mixing with the world is clarifying, thought Montaigne, who found us much confined, pent up, fearing experience as if it were the plague, seeing our noses clearly or a little more, perhaps the black on white beneath the walls, disdainful of the clamor beyond the moat. Montaigne, the irrepressible, leaps up clean from the page, who'd want to keep him out? Still, there are others who require some losses before we can entertain them. Stiffening, we forget that when reason fails us, we make use of blessed experience. Aren't we too much like men squaring the circle, lying upon their wives, locking the barn door before the horse gets in? Well, it's supposed to be a bad thing to lock the barn door after the horse is gone, but you know, at least you've had a horse. and. You've got some manure for your garden, you know, but if you lock it before the horse gets in, it's really pretty bad. Um, the last infirmity starts with a quotation from Milton. Fame is a motherfucker, the poet, well, or a paraphrase from Milton. But <laughs> fame is a motherfucker, the poet saith. Or was it a spur or a two-handed engine? Whatever that means. Anyhow, it seems from this blue side of the great divide, Sometimes a well, more often a poison spring in the man killing twenty mule borax flats, the pointing finger, not the moon. The astronauts, their womb was galaxies, had to come down at last to a stifling, uncaring world, shrink bait forever. The new law or the old, it doesn't matter. Outlaws themselves, the judges, hang sharpies, snake oil salesmen, drifters, and whores, and love their work. Oh, that mirage, that courthouse, a dream of the drinking fountain beside the door. I'm supposed to dislike fame. But. Then a character named Billy shows up. Uh, I, I had a secret office in the library, uh, just loaded with books and things, no phone. Uh, even this was before computers. Even I mean, since how far back I started these, I'd come in and roll a slip a sheet of paper through the platen. Your your fathers and mothers will tell you what that was like, right? And start to write. And I thought I've been writing them slowly and deliberately for a long time now, and I ought to be able to do it. So what happens if I just start to write? I'd have books open on the on the on the desk. I I thought of Pound, who who during I think the Chinese Adams. Cantos had, had books hanging from ropes over his desk, you know, and he'd pull one and copy a little out and swing another one back and things like that. I didn't quite get that far. But I was having a good time. I mean, I decided one day I was going to write about chainsaws, so I wrote chainsaws down on the page. And then I wrote, chainsaws were comforting to Billy's mind. That's the male Billy. I think the first Billy was a female Billy, and this is her, going out. Everybody's name, with one exception near the end, starts with a B for reasons that never got clear. I mean, I was interested in Burton and people like that, so it just seemed like something to keep going. But here's Billy. Billy was nervous. She had to be, to be. What with all the risks and the faint heart, sometimes out of control and sometimes stopped. That gave her a fright, all right. Besides, seeing that virtue is time spent, hadn't she done everything that everybody wanted? 
Freight trains, lasers, and cancer cells were not, she knew this most assuredly any more, determined than her fierce programmed unswervings. But the world at large, like a madman, hadn't they failed at present to chart it all? At the door, looking into herself, she saw them vanish. The disease, the sharply directed, the scheduled run, and looking so little else. She tried the bell. And then other things begin to happen uh, to Billy, and then another Billy shows up. He spells his name differently. I had no idea there was going to be more than one or that they were going to even go through poems. And I won't read you all of them. There's not exactly a plot, but it's like a little story that comes in and out. Imprisoned lover singing freedom. Chainsaws were comforting to Billy's mind. Finesse was out of the question. Leveling good wood and rotten, noisy, irreversible, like Billy at his best, they cleared his head like the bars he came to after the killing floor of Southeast Asia where he had prayed for death. The humiliated he knew inherit the earth. Wasn't he the only luckless man he knew who, screwing his courage to the sticking point, went scared to a new massage parlor only to find Miss Emily didn't do windows? His regular girl, high-spirited, volatile, lived in the cupboard, sang leader each more impassioned till five o'clock, then trembled in the glass beside him all night long. It's awful to think that at this moment we're making more billies. Then Burton shows up, and Burton takes several forms. I mean, he keeps the same name, but he's, first of all, Renaissance Burton, the melancholy Burton. Then he's the explorer Burton, and then he becomes Richard Burton, the wife of, uh, the wife of Elizabeth Taylor. <laughs> some, some of you remember that, right? I don't think it was ever clear to them, you know, in his times, no. But, uh, fair and nice pieces are Burton makes his move. Uh, Burton, uh, this, this early Burton is a kind of scholar, and you remember that melancholy Burton talking about melancholia says there are many symptoms, including the collection of all of these things, that is a symptom, all of these odds and ends that I'm giving you in this great encyclopedia. But he's trying to make the best of, of his learning as a compensation for getting older. Fair and nice pieces, or Burton makes his move. The man of 60 turning his thoughts to love after a life of study has it made. Burton consoled himself. Hadn't he read more pieces on love than Casanova had? Admittedly long in the tooth, but better hung, he saw the old masters heavy on his walls, with wisdom than the young, he nevertheless faltered little. Generally to fair nice pieces, old age and foul linen are two most odious things. But young people loved Yeats, and hadn't he understood Burton more and more these days? At last he was ready to put aside his books, from the decline of the West through Strauss, he understood the owl of Minerva begins its flight in the, du in the dusk. Here nor there, in the East, Burton was home, Allah be praised. He became a Bedouin, and around the fire heard thousands of tales, and none with the ignorance he thought he'd left behind. The young bridegroom who found his bride chloroformed in bed, this note pinned to the pillow, Mama says you are to do with me what you like. The violence quickening his blood here, delicately spiced by the manual grip of holy books of love. Yet sometimes he missed a simpler innocence. St. Francis, seeing a man and a maid engaged in a dark corner lifting up his hands, thank God for this Christian charity. It would be years before he would write, the world is growing vile and bet. The last line uh, of the next one, which is also about, uh, about uh, Burton, the explorer, um, is true. He, he, he translated the Arabian Nights. Uh, he also, tra and he tra we have one of the books of love, but translated other books of love, and, uh, and they suffered after his death when his wife burned them. You'll hear how she burned them, I think, uh, at this time. On the verge, it's called. The perfumed garden, a Muslim work of love, held ignorance of shared pleasure to be a sin, gave hundreds of names for things that barely had one name where Burton came from, the crested one, 
with a red comb that rises with full arousal, the unionist, the crusher, and the verge, the tailor, swimmer, housebreaker, liberator, all with such nice distinctions, the doc LRs. This is the veritable manner of making love, that favorite with all the ladies, especially when doing the tachik el hub, or hair to hair. Somehow, Victorian England wasn't game for the book he hoped might save it. After his death, his wife burned the crown of his life, one page at a time. Did you like that detail? <laughs> That's all I know about it, right? She burned it one page at a time. Royal Burton. Imagine Burton married to Cleopatra, around the world in 80 ways or more. Who could tire of her world? Those two soft hemispheres touched with violet, were these the eyes, Burton intoned, that launched a thousand scripts? <laughs> but was this what he wanted? His golden voice bawling for liquor in the afternoon. They had it all on film, two quarts a day, fighting, eating, and screwing across Mexico with iguanas every night, soon added up. Twelve million bucks and fifty pounds apiece, and their subjects loved it all. Still laboring under his dreamy queen, Burton saw in them both the veritable anatomy of melancholy. If you take a little boat ride under the place where Night of the Iguana was filmed, and there's a large boulder about as tall as this room that has a nice curve to it, right? And kind of curved like this and curves up like that. And the guide will tell you this is Elizabeth Taylor's ass. <laughs> The rules of the game. At first it was better than fun. The companionable nights, the whiskey by the fire, the dark behind us, the light inside us lifting the old tales over the ancient woods. But even then, the game was receding from our hearts. By now, it has been years since anybody saw the great brown bear now even the squirrels and rabbits are talking to themselves, and the old forest has dwindled to this lawn below the porch where I've sat hunting in my peculiar way, the lights and liver darkening, the last cloud no bigger than a man's hand, one of my own. So whistle up the dogs and piss on the fire. This was the last hunt, and it's over now. This is Billy again. Uh, the inverted thief that comes in that I paraphrase or quote at the very end is Genet, who had this great observation that he uh, really hated it, the idea that people made love without him. <laughs> you know, like, you can understand that, can't you? I think there, you know, what about me? Powerhouse. Resentment gnawed at Billy like a bone. She dreamed of power and had it in her hand only at home alone with the lights turned low, the family hit list growing in her mind till no one was left but her. She mourned for them only until the daylight brought them back like vampires in reverse. Then the black dogs, her boss, her mother, strangers in the street howled at the door or used the telephone, all of them out to get her. A tiny sun in a universe of mirrors. She was sure that everything said to her was about her that the moon burned with her heat. Like the inverted thief, his mind a prison cell, she couldn't stand the thought that everyone everywhere made love without her. Breathless. Uh, I quote Alan Ladd, the old star of many so-called noir films, and I think he said this in his own person, if he had an own person. It's kind of sad to think of it. But he used to have to, <clears throat> he was, I, you know, when I was a kid, you go to movies and you want to be all the stars, you know? I wanted to be Alan Ladd. I was already taller than Alan Ladd was then, right? Great voice. He used to act standing on a box when he had, until till they found Victoria, uh, uh, Veronica Lake, who was a little bitty too. But he used to have to stand on a box where they dig a trench for the co-star to walk in while he'd have these scenes and stuff. And no wonder he drank himself to death. I mean, sort of understand. I wanted to be Alan Ladd. I wanted to be Anthony Quinn. <coughs> I wanted to be Gilbert Rowland. All those guys. 
Breathless, Billy demurred, well, inwardly, inwardly at least. That was his way. And there he was dark, low lighting, fog, and a high angle shot, the tilted hat, the cigarette, and behind him, the alley of a thousand melodramas. Killers with heart and heroes without honor. He'd watched them in the darkness all his life. Nobody knew to look at him, five foot four, green eyed and shy, that he was a killer too, and knew all about love. Something between a man and a 45 that doesn't jam. Sure, he'd had a few troubles. The moving dolly, filming his life, just wouldn't let him go. He touched himself to make sure he was all there. <coughs> right now. It's 19 years today since he first held, so I'm sorry. It's 19 years today since he last held a drink in his hand or held his breath while smoke filled as much of him as he could stand till letting it out, he sought oblivion of the trace of memory or anticipation and his life fell into a death spiral. Since then, he's been around folks like him. When he's been asked and sometimes eager when he hasn't been, he talks to the ones who are not even sure they want to learn how to stop killing themselves. That feeling still seems close to him some days. Right now, he's okay, and that's enough right now. It was a year after I, I uh, stopped, well, it was a year after I stopped drinking that I stopped smoking dope, because I, I thought, you know, I've, I smoke dope every day for 15 years. I know I'm not addicted to it. You know? I mean, nobody knows dope like me. So I finally had to come to terms with that. But a year after I, uh, I, 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 was, I was clean, I was talking to my wife. We, got in, we don't argue much. We got into an argument. And she said, are you aware of the fact that when every time we argue, you hold your breath? And I thought, oh, Jesus. I mean, old habits die hard. You know? I was like, it really makes me mad when you, you know, I'm saying things like that. You know? I thought, I've got to pay some attention to that. Winding up. Who would have thought Billy would turn to drink? Her father and mother and sisters were all alkies, and to be one of those things was the sorriest lot Billy could ever imagine. They'd needed her, and God, she had served them, waiting hand and foot on every little whim. Then the sons of bitches left her in the lurch and gave up drinking. Well, two by dying, but the others went cold turkey. She began to burn as if they'd laid her off. Think of it, no more pain. No more attention, enraged and finicky, no unpredictable storms to withstand, she thought, beside the sink as she twisted the neck off another cold one. Hell, here it comes, sister. Somebody had to do it. Under the lamplight, Burton was odd. He is odd. Burton was odd. Burton loved the dentist, especially his pretty assistants. Were uniforms merely the image of things to be removed, a glimpse of those undiscovered worlds therein, <coughs> the sanculatist sea of light and love, a philosophy of clothes? And the little pain, his mouth wide open as they brushed his arm, his imprisoned arm with their unconscious limbs, well, somehow it was meant for him. The probes and scraping, Burton imagined they made his teeth hard, too. When the real pain started, he had a trick or two picked up in a book he'd forgotten as a boy. He simply read himself. From above the chair, he watched the odd commotion beneath the lamp. He thought he made out the title, The Razor's Edge. <coughs> the Invariable Paths. Billy hears something on the radio at the end. That's the quotation at the end. Sundown again. And, and you didn't, I didn't know that, that Billy had had a lover until the lover was gone. But you know, it's that way sometimes, isn't it? <laughs> Even with yourself, right? <laughs> God, I didn't know. The invariable paths. Sundown again. Since Bobby left, the sky left over from dark to dark calls aimlessly. This is the first drink. The whiskey light on its way through fire to the blackout used to be her time, and now without her, it still is. 
Her fingers touch her as she sees the street lights, the invariable veins of love in the valley below come on with their bright traffic. Later, perhaps, she'll fade out of herself. Perhaps tonight, Billy won't even remember going to bed, won't have the dream of the old man selling rabbits, won't remember the knife or the radio that brings her back each day, that whispers now, maybe tomorrow. I've done enough dying today. This alludes to a famous um, pianist who, uh, just before his death, I think he had tuberculosis, uh, played a famous version of the uh, Chopin waltzes at Besançon. Nocturne. Those other dreams out of a former life seemed to swarm at her ears as broken chords, as music visible, a heightened world singing to the heart in exile, arpeggios lingering a little in the darkened air, the minor calm, the dazzle, the return in arabesques, airy and unassailable. Her past was living, while through the open window these cooling breezes almost imperceptibly in caressing coils in fitful eddies were beginning their gentle nocturnes. Billy had played over and over the waltzes at Besançon, thought she could live forever in the fading bell of the tender, sad exuberance of farewell. I did a, 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 a kind of modernization of a, of a, of, of, of a Borges couplet, uh, but he also was doing a modernization of uh, Camerarius. So it's, it's kind of a, it's called the regret of Heraclitus. Each person has their own uh, name that they put in, right? That uh, I who was many men will never rise once from the banks of Sophia Lorenz dies. That's it. Of the spheres. Um, now there's a reference to Tchaikovsky's um, Eugene Onegin here, too. That's what, that's what I'm trying to describe uh, at the beginning of. Of the spheres. One of the things that happens to the female Billy is that she's sort of redeemed in some ways. She, things turn out all right for her for a couple of different reasons. One has to do with music and her, uh, her kinship with other people. And the other Billy seems to turn out all right for similar reasons, kinship with other people. Of the spheres, sun turning flowers, yellow on Thursday, blue jeans on Monday, purple on your fingernail, the grave chromatics of mismatched desire. Billy had felt divided all her life. Now, did you sigh? Did you sigh? Billy could hear descending minor scales, the colorations of a universe of sound. As a little girl, singing with her girlfriends while they picked berries, cherries, raspberries, red currants, she sang to keep from eating the bright red notes bending the trees and bushes. Now as she stirred, the world within began to stir. All day, she played her records endlessly. All night, she watched those incandescent textures turning. Burton just goes to heaven. The poem, uh, kind of a cento, it's made up of quotations, last words that various people had. And, uh, you know, I, because I use the word castrum, I want you to know that I'm aware of the fact that all of the men in Burton, all of the people in Burton's heaven are men. <clears throat> Burton in heaven. The world shall end in a, like a comedy, and we shall meet at last in heaven. Glorious Gainsborough believed we would all heartily converge out here. The lovely clouds and shaggy parks, our home. Constable Monet, Rousseau, Ryder, and Dove, and Van Dyke shall be of the company. And Beethoven, hearing the wonders of his life, and Wilde, dying beyond his means, sharp to the end, either the wallpaper goes or I go. And Voltaire telling the priest when finally pressed to renounce Satan and all his works, this is no time to be making new enemies. Rabelais going to seek a great perhaps, they have already greased my boots. What jolly friends after the tears, the wringing hands, the last words for an endless end to melancholy. James Madison, I always talk better lying down. 
and Stonewall Jackson, leaving as a southerner with an old soldier's communal sense and need, let us cross the river and rest in the shade. And Hegel, dialectical right to the end, only one man ever understood me, and he didn't understand me either. Now we all in one gigantic castrum will understand, not knowledge simply, but simply love of knowledge. The first step toward philosophy is incredulity. Even Diderot would never, himself would never believe. From this cento of all ages, one handsome Venus that they couldn't recall whatever they left behind. This one is about Burton apparently leaves heaven and he takes a yoga lesson. Um, this it had some bearing on me. I was invited to two yoga lessons and I only went to one. It was an introductory thing. I'm still waiting for the other. And it wasn't that kind that, um, that you know, that they, they have you in a sweat room or something like that to apparently to approximate conditions in Calcutta. I have something to say about that. But it was a room in which they had recently done that. So it was still pretty damn hot. Burton at yoga. They had the heaters on in summer. Sweat made my fit, feet slip on the sticky mat. Bikram began in Calcutta, the leader smiled, so the heat gives us a sense of origin. Why not dead bodies piled in the doorways? Or legless beggars pleading with ladies dressed in pink as rich as Vishnu himself, I wondered. Yoga humor was not part of the package. But revenge fell swiftly while I panted through each contortion, trying to ignore the aficionados wrapped in poses out of a solo Kama Sutra. At the blessed end, the leader even corrected my corpse position. I guess there's something nearly gratifying about not getting that quite right just yet. In another country. Why Billy waited, no one ever knew. He waited before breathing, answering the phone, writing a letter, going out the door, smoking his cigarettes down to the fingernail, nervy and catatonic. Fearfully, he waited for his father to come down the hall to have a little talk, hearing the rattle of the buckle as the belt snaked through the loops, and then the long, humiliating talks. The longhorn would make him cry, would make him promise never to do whatever he did again. Don't make your mother cry. But Billy knew who made her cry. She was crying in the next room now, but he couldn't say it. Then they'd shake hands, the little boy hopeful, heading for freedom, when, just as I touched the doorknob, the cold smile, we've got a little something to do. And they both knew, no matter how far, far from that room he went in his head, that the rattler would raise thick, clotted screams from him, my arms pinned between the bed and the wall, with shame like murder flooding the neighborhood. Well, that's the end of that fucking tradition. Um, the Hinge. I, I read this the last time I was here, but it was a long time ago, and probably almost nobody is here. So I think Richard Schreier, when I read it, said that's, he'd heard it before. That's kind of your signature poem. So I thought, well, screw it. I'm not going to read it, but I'm going to read it anyway. The Hinge. These visions of my death, my comings back, the Billy's, Burton's, secret, schizophrenic, these fearful suspects of my dormancy, the black stars doubling everything I saw, the surviving twin and premature, I was at four pounds thought too little to mutilate, so my circumcision came when I was five, a tonsillectomy thrown in. I was scared, I am sure, and mad. I must have been. After all, it had worked fine up until then, and I saw no reason to make it shorter. But what I remember vividly was the ether, the mask, the backwards counting. As I breathed, I said, I like this. This tastes like bubblegum. Then I was nothing indeed. The next morning, my throat, to say nothing else, was too sore to eat the ice cream I'd been promised. 
The nurse told me, I've seen a lot of little boys dragged in here for this business, but nobody, not a one of them, ever said he loved the ether. I know now, if anyone ever gives you a drug, and you wake up in pain, and they've cut off the end of your dick, and you think it's a good trip, you've got a drug problem. <laughs> now I admit it. I read as a boy of Dolly, himself a boy, sitting in a public stall, fervently repelled by a piece of mucus on the wall until he wrapped some paper around his hand and wiped it off in holy terror. Dried solid, it sliced his finger to the bone. I have not told this story more than three times in 35 years. There have been many others at every door crying their secrecy. I have not shaken them. Now as the sun returns, I let these stories in and let them out. Suzuki Roshi's door blowing in the wind open and shut, the spirit where it listeth, the breathy constellations overhead turning the season. This was a winter's tale. There's royalty at the end of this next poem, the duke and count. Um, that part of France that I'm talking about is Montaigne's part of France. There were also other things that went on there, and I'll tell you a little about them here. Uh, uh, Montaigne's uh, father uh, had all the people in the village learn Latin so they could speak to him in Latin. Apparently some words even still exist in French, but uh, he became the great writer in French. And, uh, uh, the title's from him, More Tender and Everywhere Open. Burton's been reading all day long. The world rolls from his eyeballs, a small distant globe we're on in a little village in Perigord, 500 years ago in another tongue. A father taught the villagers for his son, Latin, a few words still surviving. Majestically, the boy grew into the tongues of experience, the demotic genius of his countrymen. Burton dog-eared this book from the tribes of Gaul, and the painters who dreamed their animals underground, and Josephine Baker's chateau. He deserves the whip who spends his time with wine and sauces. To this, even royalty concurred, the count with splank, the duke with irresistible, defining swang. So when I read that before, I said, what's that last word? I said, it's swang. It don't mean a thing if ain't got that swang. That's <laughs> where it comes from. And splank is what Basie was called because of his minimalist piano style. Splank, flank. Poetic with a line from Basil Bunting. It might be from a handbook on recorders. That's not the line. But I put quotations around it as an epigram, but I just make epigrams up. Epigraphs up. Like the book has an epigram, two epigraphs. I have drunk and seen the spider. Well, that's from Winter's Tale. I didn't make that up. You know? This one. I didn't make this up either. Jeremy Fickle, A Treatise on the Fantastical Understanding, 1763. A poet, if he aspire to write the true classic rough news, must be scholarly, scattered, and mad. Poetic, with a line from Basil Bunning. It might be from a handbook on recorders. For one thing, it's on the air. You can hear music, knowing inflected by the ear, not wood, not even mouthpiece, but the lovely thipple. Hey, that's like nipple, my little daughter laughs. And the conveyor of this joy is a player whose breathing tunes the hollow that she fills, empties and fills again. I am caught up in the roll of the hull, this ecstasy of naming, this gathering up of more than 50 years in a wide harbor, a life made up of words, all of them here before we finally heard them, and consolation rolling upon the tide as the player's breath warms the fipple, the tone clears. Ardor, attend us as our stars descend. Before sleep, this is the Magdalene with the smoking flame, the delator, you've seen those delator paintings, right, the shadow and the skull. 
This room goes on forever. The dark hush glows like departing love that will not go. There are no edges. Here everything is rounded by light and its companion. As if dazed, she stares beyond the mortifying rope, even beyond the radiant candle flame deepening the room she sits in. Rising up out of the purifying light, a thread, a smoky thin reminder, whispers that guilt is the mortal trail of spirit arguing no light without shadow, flame without matter's ash. She holds her contemplation like a breath, absently fingering a burnished skull that answers only a little of her glow. What do you want about a teacher? Yeah, uh, uh, a certain kind of shy teacher, uh, pathetic, pedantic, and, and pathetic. I knew a teacher once who, who was so shy, he lectured to what people called the phantom student, right? I mean, there'd be a little, sometimes just a little room with a few people, and he would talk to the student there in the empty chair, you know, tell his jokes, most of which were, you know, had punchlines in foreign languages. <laughs> he and the student would laugh. There's one line in French, right, that's really translated from uh, Latin. Um, uh, 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 Seneca's uh, doing a kind of ubi sunt, but it's a kind of a scholarly one. And where is my room of declamation? <laughs> the things that you'll miss, right, as a scholar. Where's my classroom? Where's my old classroom? From the highest tower, gravid with text, he leans into the room shyest of pedants, never meets an eye. He smiles and slowly nods toward the empty chair. He has been drinking toward this for a lifetime, his punchlines always in a foreign tongue with a private tone for footnotes. Thus, difficile est saturum non scribere, ou est ma salle du déclamation or mon semblable, mon frère. Flying over the missing man formation, a flag snaps, a bugle blows, his acolyte becomes flesh almost and tabled at his tits, as Crashaw said. At the drop of a pin, the planes are gone, the flag still, the bugle dark, the phantom listener, the phantom man, the Room. Last poem. Um, this is not in the book. Um, it's called Empty Air. And um, there was a, a really quite beautiful show at the uh, Stanford Museum where, where I go. And uh, I was asked to uh, write a poem uh, to read at the uh, opening night or the group night of this thing. It usually <coughs> used to be the kind of thing that just make me crazy and and nervous. I, I just, I'm not nervous that way anymore. I just go ahead and do it, you know. And uh, but I used to read through, and you know how you you resent being asked, and then then when you don't do it, you resent really resent that you didn't do it, but resent them for asking you. And so, well, I just decided to do it. But there was another kind of impetus. It's a show. It's called From Picasso to Thibault. <clears throat> it's with a lot of things, and, and and boy, you know, if you had the catalog to this show, you'd understand everything about this poem. But. <laughs> Quote from Robert, Robert Motherwell, who had something in there, it's other things, but it's probably less important that you figure it out. Once you get outside, you're near the end, you know, there's a, a Goldsworthy reference, and then of course the Rodin Gates of Hell, and pretty soon when I get to the Jim Dine painting in my neighborhood, that is the good side of my neighborhood, the rich side where Braden used to live, right? Um, <laughs> but, but maybe not in the rich part, right? But, um, but uh, then, then it's really as close to the end. But I was team teaching a course with Lee Yearly in Religious Studies, and we're doing a course on religious poetry. And Lee specialty was Dante and Dufu, and uh, I did a bunch of other stuff, and we had a really good time. But when we were doing Dufu, he said, Dufu watched the end of one of the great civilizations. Do any of you ever feel that you might be at the end of a great civilization? And 
And now the students went like, uh, uh, yeah, or uh, <laughs> no. Uh, that's about all I was able to do, too. Until I went home and started turning it over, and I thought, well, I wrote this poem to uh, kind of address that question. Right? I'm here in this room with all this wonderful art. Right? Empty air. Epigraph. Well, I'm standing next to a mountain. Chop it down with the edge of my hand. Jimi Hendrix. Here in this empty air, we reckon ink, color, and volume as a way of life. Leibniz's chain across the galaxy, a string in a spiral. China and Japan whirled to our coasts millennia ago, and Hockney brought Matisse to West Hollywood, bright slanted bars and palms. Everything's possible. We move the universe. Rain or shine, we rain destruction on the world. Baghdad, Hiroshima. With elegies on canvas, black is death, anxiety, white is life, eclat. But there is a light we'll see, if it ever comes, right through our eyelids. The delta, watered in rooms and rows, reflective calm will slide away. Likewise, Potrero Hill whose trees and poles and shadows upright against the downward slope will disappear while the fire takes the shape at once. These are fragile treasures we walk among, our memory, children holding hands against the glare, clouds of blossoms on a string, I'm sorry, on a stream. Dufu, his world falling about him, said he wrote on empty air, alone. This worthless paper trembles in the room of beauty. What will survive, I wonder, at the very end? Stone river outside in the drying grasses, the bronzes maybe, the gate of agonies, no bigger than a hand, regretfully a mother kisses her child on the edge of doom just above your head on the left side. Fat man in a hungry world, I write these lines. The glowing page effacing the hand that made it. Last night an old man slept across the street from the gates of hell, snoring on Muscatel. A short walk from my house, a Jim Dine bathroom, bathrobe hangs in the living room. My dog and I pause in the darkness often, feeling the glow, the rich red wonder of it, wishing the warmth pouring from that beauty were enough. Thank you for your attention.